Hello to everybody, I'm Marco Beato, Associate Professor in Sport and Exercise Science at University of Suffolk. Today we will have uh, uh, the opportunity to listen to Kevin De Kaiser that uh, will present uh, on our channel Understanding Sports Science uh, this uh, presentation titled Perception and Application of Flywheel Training by Professional Soccer Practitioners. Thank you, Kevin, for your time. I would like to add that Kevin is doing a PhD on flywheel training and uh, is uh, collaborating with me at the University of Suffolk. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Marco. Just like to briefly add that this paper is available online and it is open access. So if anyone would like to access it, please feel free to look for it online. Before anything else, it's probably best that we just discuss briefly what flywheel training actually is. Flywheel training is a resistance training method that was initially developed to be utilized in space and has found more recently application in both health and sporting environments. Here on the left, we can have a very brief description of what the concentric and eccentric phase of flywheel training looks like. So as we can see, both movement and force go in the same direction during the concentric phase, whereas during the eccentric phase, movement comes in the same direction that it came from and force continues to go in the same direction. So they go in opposite direction. And what this means from a repetition perspective in terms of concentric and eccentric outputs, we can see here in the figure in the middle, how they differ between concentric and eccentric phases. And as we can see here, there seems to be an eccentric overload. And so this can be achieved with certain factors such as appropriate technique and certain devices being used. Nonetheless, it's interesting to consider that you can achieve an eccentric overload if certain factors are obtained. On the right here, we have a schematic representation of a flywheel leg press, which may look slightly different to a traditional resistance training leg press or a weight stack machine used in the gym. And although it looks different to say, for example, the movement uh, that's being displayed on the left, it has the same concept and uses the same principles. And we can say the same for these machines. Although they may look slightly different one from another, they all are based on the same principle of the flywheel. Here to try and give a better understanding of what the flywheel movement looks like, we can see a soccer athlete performing a flywheel squat, attempting to decelerate the movement at the end. This is hopefully to try and achieve an eccentric overload. On the left here, we can see some of the functions and attachments uh, of the flywheel device with their own descriptions. So now that we've discussed a little bit what flywheel training is, we'd like to highlight what it's for. As with many resistance training methods, flywheel training is utilized in sport to try and enhance sport performance. Specifically, we try to improve change of direction ability and jumping ability. But as practitioners, we need to also try and improve other factors such as strength and power. Ultimately, one of our objectives is also to try and reduce the likelihood of injuries occurring, specifically muscular skeletal injuries. The flywheel is shown to be applied and researched for all of these factors. So now we've gone over a little bit of what the flywheel training is and what it's applied for. I'd like to discuss our methods for this investigation and our aims and purpose. So we surveyed 51 professional soccer practitioners from around Europe to try and understand their perspectives and how they applied flywheel training. It was also of interest to try and understand what they viewed as limitations of both the literature and how flywheel training is currently applied. One of the first questions that we asked practitioners was whether or not they believed familiarization to be necessary. As we can see here on the left, majority of practitioners agreed that flywheel training necessitates or effective implementation of flywheel training necessitates familiarization. But it's interesting to see with one of our follow-up questions that familiarization differed from practitioner to practitioner. And although a majority of practitioners prescribed two to three sessions to familiarize athletes, some practitioners prescribed one session while some prescribed four. It was also interesting to see that although there isn't a lot of literature to support the use of player dependent familiarization, some practitioners also utilize this technique. The next questions that we asked about flywheel training was how it was applied. Initially, we asked practitioners how frequently they applied flywheel training and broke this down into two different phases, the preseason and the in-season period. So initially during the preseason period, practitioners seemed to be applying flywheel training between two to three sessions per week. And during the in-season period, they reduced this to one to two sessions per week. This is also in line with the literature, which typically sees a reduction in both resistance training 
and plyometric and physical training to then focus more on tactical and technical training as well as recovery because games do come thick and fast during the in-season period. The next question we asked practitioners was which exercise they selected most often and which one they used most often within the programs. And it wasn't surprising, given that majority of the literature consists of squats, to see that the squat was also king in application with a whopping 40% or sorry, a whopping 40 out of 51 practitioners reporting that they utilize the squat. 30 practitioners also stated that they utilize the lunge or acceleration movement, while 20 practitioners reported using the lift and hinge movements such as deadlift and 19 practitioners reporting used reported using open kinetic chain exercises such as the leg curl or knee extension. As we can see here in the two figures on the left, a variety of exercises can be performed with the flywheel. And this obviously depends on the type of flywheel that we have. So here we can see that there are conical pulleys. We can also see that there are horizontal cylindrical discs, which may differ in its style and function, but allow athletes to perform a variety of movements. It's important to consider that the differences between devices can also guarantee or can also mean that certain outcomes may or may not be obtained. Specifically, one aspect that's very important to flywheel training according to practitioners is the ability to receive an eccentric overload. This was another question that we asked and it seems that practitioners, although they value this, they can apply training in many different ways and so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only thing that's important, but it's a very important aspect of flywheel training. The next bit that we went on to was to try and compare practitioner beliefs and current evidence in soccer. As we can see here, the ability to improve change of direction performance with flywheel training was supported by a majority of practitioners, which is in line with the current evidence. Similarly, practitioners believe that flywheel training can enhance jumping performance, which is also in line with the evidence. And although we see a similar amount of practitioners describing their confidence in the application of flywheel training for enhancing sprint performance, the evidence does not seem as clear at the moment. This doesn't mean that flywheel training isn't effective for sprint performance or enhancing sprint performance, but rather that at the moment, the literature isn't as clear as the literature for change of direction and, and jumping performance with soccer players. A similar story seems to be the case for strength, whereby a majority of practitioners support the use of flywheel training. Uh, and this belief, this practitioner belief is also supported by the evidence in the literature within both soccer and athletic populations. In terms of injury prevention, a majority of practitioners once again believe that flywheel training could be effective for reducing the likelihood of injuries, but the evidence does not seem as clear at the moment in terms of this. For acutely enhancing performance through the use of post-activation performance enhancement protocols, a majority of practitioners also believe that the flywheel device can be utilized within these protocols, with the evidence at the moment suggesting that acute performance can be enhanced. Finally, another question that we asked practitioners was whether or not they believe that traditional resistance training and flywheel resistance training are equivalent or superior to one another. So when we asked practitioners whether or not they believed flywheel training was superior for eccentric overload, practitioners responded suggesting that majority of them were, which is also in line with the evidence. As we can see here, in terms of injury prevention and strength, the majority of practitioners remained unsure whether or not flywheel training was superior to or equivalent to uh, res traditional resistance training, which once again is in line with the current evidence landscape. In terms of our investigation, we also tried to highlight possible future directions and investigations which might be worthy. The first of which was more comparisons between traditional resistance training and flywheel training to try and understand the differences between the two and also understand what outcomes may be possible with one or the other or possibly both. The second of which was more investigations determining the effectiveness or efficacy of flywheel training for reducing injury likelihood. This is an important aspect of the literature that currently remains relatively untouched. And the final and most important possibly recommendation that we could make for future directions is to investigate the, the practicality and application of flywheel training and also to develop evidence-based guidelines. These can involve recommendations for volume, intensity or inertial load, as well as training frequency with a variety of athletes, but specifically 
female soccer players and elite level male players. I obviously can't complete this presentation without thanking my two supervisors for my PhD, Dr. Stuart McCurlin Naylor and Dr. Marco Beato. If you're interested in any of our literature or any of the literature that we've researched, uh, please feel free to click on the link uh, to go to our project on ResearchGate where we have all of our papers available, but you might also be able to find other relevant rich literature on flywheel devices. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think it uh, has been uh, very, very clear. And thank you for uh, obviously showing uh, uh, our uh, project on uh, ResearchGate. And uh, this is uh, for sure a, a very good link for uh, practitioners and people that are interested in what we are doing. So I have uh, three questions for you and I hope you can clarify uh, <laughs> my doubts. So the first point is uh, based on your experience, what is the right flywheel training frequency that you should suggest or schedule anyway per week in season in uh, uh, football? Or what is uh, um, your suggestion based on your experience? Yeah, uh, I think it, based on my experience, one session is more than enough to induce improvements. Although if possible, it's, it'd be good to do two sessions a week, whereby one session is focused more on strength development, where we incur a little bit more muscle damage. And we also uh, possibly use higher inertial loads to try and focus on strength. Whereas the second session, we can focus on accessory movements, maybe possibly do some rotational movements, um, or maybe even use lighter inertias to specifically focus on trying to reduce the likelihood of injury. So maybe targeting the hamstrings once again, and giving the hamstrings two specific flywheel sessions during the week. Um, but if possible, two. If not, then just one strength training session a week is probably sufficient. Thank you very much. Based on uh, as did, uh, sorry, the follow-up of that, of this question, what do you think about microdoses? If a practitioner doesn't have the time for a second session, do that does it make sense for you to have a say uh, a micro dose of a fluid training uh, maybe closer to the to the match day um, we suppose that we do the first session uh, three or four days before the match does it make sense for the practitioner to have uh, another small dose a couple of days before the match what is your opinion about that yeah, definitely. I think once you familiarize the participants, once they're confident in the execution of the movements, you can use lighter inertias to try and achieve a higher power output and try and focus a little bit more on power. But that stimulus, if applied consistently, especially during the season where typically we focus on recovery, we focus on tactical training, we do lose some physical elements, we do lose sprint, we do lose jump ability. And so even trying to microdose, as you mentioned, during the week is probably going to be effective over a month's period. Um, to try and maintain, probably not improve, but certainly maintain physical performance, which over a long season can be very, very important. In terms of application, um, possibly you could utilize the, the day of the match with people who haven't started the game. So if somebody hasn't taken part in the game to try and induce some more stress to the, to the muscles, you could utilize your typical aerobic or anaerobic running that you'd perform after the game. But you could also add, due to the portability of the flywheel, um, some strength training for the people who didn't take part. And that could be an additional stress to consider, an additional stress to try and encourage adaptation and growth with people who didn't take part in the game. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for this, uh, this answer. Uh, the last one is related to uh, practitioner belief in uh, uh, sprinting improvements after a flywheel training. So obviously we have evidence, and also the practitioner believe uh, in the right thing when we talk about change of direction improvements, jumping improvements, but can you clarify a bit uh, why actually we have, um, we have this uh, situation when we talk about uh, sprinting performance. Can flywheel improve sprinting performance? Do we have enough evidence to say that, uh, or for the moment, uh, we should wait before to obviously have a statement or uh, believe in that. Or what is your opinion? Yeah, I guess uh, there's two things that I'd like to touch on there. In terms of confidence within the literature, um, something that maybe practitioners are confident in, but the evidence isn't there yet, is injury prevention or reduction of like injuries. So at the moment, there isn't, there aren't many investigations that actually look the effectiveness or the efficacy of flywheel training for reducing injury likelihood. 
but practitioners are very confident in that. So that's something definitely that we need more investigations in. In terms of sprinting performance, I think it's a, it's a bit of a paradox because with training, we have less and less time. We want more and more. So we want to see bigger improvements in less time. And so how a lot of the protocols, how some of our protocols as well have been um, applied in the, in the literature and in practice is, oh, we'll do one session a week and we'll try to see improvements. Realistically, we know that we probably need a little bit more of a, a greater frequency. And so there are a variety of protocols, some applying training once a week using, for example, a lateral squat that haven't seen improvements in sprint performance. Whereas there are other protocols that have utilized a leg press two to three times per week with elite level handball players and have seen improvements in sprint performance. And so I think more than anything, the reason why the evidence is unclear at the moment is because there's a large variation in application, both from an exercise selection perspective, but also a training frequency perspective. And so it's important that we be honest and fair and probably state that one training session per week is sufficient during the in-season period to maintain physical performance from a sprinting perspective, but it may not always be effective for improving sprint performance. If you're looking for improvements in sprint performance, the literature at the moment probably recommend at least two sessions or maybe even three sessions with a lot of the protocols that have utilized only one session not being very effective. Thank you, Kevin. Honestly, your presentation has been very clear. So I take the opportunity to thank you for the time uh, to be part uh, of uh, our channel, Understanding Sports Science. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many people will, uh, will comment uh, your presentation and uh, probably will contact you for further clarification. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marco.